It's happening. Adults across the country can buy cannabis. People have a lot of questions, so I invite some friends over to talk about it. Joining me today is Alexandra Perry from Addiction Rehab. It, it would be really interesting to explore if cannabis could be an option. Lachlan Chang, a cultivation consultant. I think adding potentially cannabis to that toolkit is an option. And Tyler James from Eden Medicinal Society. With the introduction of legalization and more understanding of cannabis, why a lot of that can't be substituted for cannabis. I'm Chuck Rafici, and we're talking to this. We're in the midst of an opioid epidemic. Can cannabis be used to reduce opiates? I think in a lot of cases, um, cannabis can be used to curb addiction issues as it relates to opiates. We have um, right now our own opiate substitution program that we're doing ourselves. And for some of the participants in the program, they've told us that they haven't fully replaced opiates with THC, but it has definitely helped them curb the amount of opiates that they are using. And these are individuals who are using it to kind of combat the withdrawal symptoms uh, that are associated with, you know, not having that kind of opiates in their system. So I would say the early onset of what we're getting from our study that it can at least facilitate in reducing the number of deaths that are related to the crisis. Well, I think of just adding in particular with opiates in this character and to, to run with the study that he, you know, his, his company or group is running, uh, there is long-term evidence that there's synergistic effects between opiates and cannabis. So even if it's on the simple act of, again, being able to reduce the overall dose of opiates uh, with a, a co-dose of cannabis, you may see some benefits. And I think that in terms of especially sort of the fatal outcomes and the harm reduction, there's a huge benefit to be had on the immediacy there because obviously, you know, the opiate is the primary driver of fatality and overdoses. So if we can reduce the amount that's in the system, it's going to be a benefit towards, you know, general harm reduction principles, primarily starting with sort of just saving lives. Yeah, like one individual um, in Eden's program, he mentioned to us that, you know, he started off because he got in a hockey in injury. Uh, was prescribed Oxycontin, but from there he just needed something stronger and stronger and then that kind of just spiraled out of control to you know, him even moving on to heroin, unfortunately. Um, and he just found that he wanted to get more control again over his life and you know, with the assistance of our program and organizations like CAMH, we kind of gave him that stability and support um, uh, to do so. So definitely I think it's a matter of both having the availability um, to THC to these individuals, but then also the community support and programs out there to show them that you know, it will take more than just THC to get them on the right track. I think that really addresses the initial public policy issue, which is that in Canada, sort of your initial triage procedure for pain is that you're given sort of an NSAID or a non-steroidal anti-inflammatory, you get an anti-anxiolytic, you get a narcotic, and then you get cannabis. I think if we can simply flip the anxiolytic and the cannabis so that we're putting it from fourth to third, we're greatly reducing the initial contact. And I think that that is the number one thing that we can do in an immediate sense to reduce the opiate use overall, which again, I think is directly correlated to sort of the overall abuse and negative consequences that we're trying to avoid with that. Well, it's interesting, I mean, what you're saying really is that we, we need to, the medical community, or the hope, your hope is that when somebody hurts himself playing hockey, uh, or a Canadian thing, that uh, you get back pain or something, that you're getting a, a cannabis before an opiate. And we clearly don't see that today, do we? No, there's about, I think the last study was 20 million opiate prescriptions in Canada alone issued last year, right? Like if, I don't see why a lot of that or why, you know, hopefully with the introduction of legalization and more understanding of cannabis, why a lot of that can't be substituted for cannabis. I think that'd be a great kind of, you know, direction for us to be taking as society. Mm -hmm. I'd be really interested to see on a therapeutic level, because oftentimes when you're treating addiction, it's really hard to see what came first. Was it the mental health issue or was it the substance? And what is substance induced rather than something that was like pre-existing? So I think, you know, I've had n a number of clients come through and they've been addicted to crack cocaine and dealing with something like bipolar disorder or schizophrenia or borderline personality disorder, and that's their only like medication or substance to, to help them live with the symptoms of those illnesses. And I think it, it could be interesting to see if cannabis could offer a more holistic option for those individuals. And one thing you raised, Lachlan, was you know, the fact that it's not only, you know, we say at a macro level, 
uh, in states that have legalized that with legalization there's less opiates and so you know you have a positive benefit but is the benefit is it is it only substitution or is that is substitution the most important factor uh, of replacing you know, opiates with cannabis or is it helping with the withdrawal symptoms or being able to reduce opiates by using cannabis I mean is that is that an equal factor not, how does it rate I'm not sure if the data has been elucidated on that point to be fair so I would say that my own personal opinion is that probably the reduction of overall use would have the most in terms of fatalities I think when it comes to the disaggregating the remaining data on the ability of allowing people to regress off of those as part of a treatment you know there's a lot of pharmacological interventions buprenorphine um, naloxone therapies they're different pharmacological interventions to deal with addiction now I think adding potentially cannabis to that toolkit is an option, but I don't think that there's any large epidemiological data in any reasonable way that you can make a connection about its effects. Because mm -hmm. there, there is quite a big risk when someone is on methadone or suboxone, and depending on the dose of, of either of those replacements, if someone does use, their risk for an overdose is increased. Especially with clonopin and mm -hmm. any of the benzodiazepines that people use to exactly. magnify their... Yeah. yeah it's, and right. I think, it, again, to that point, it, it would be really interesting to explore if cannabis could be an option or a replacement for those opioid Offering Mainten maintenance, therapies, maintenance, I guess. yeah. It's <laughs> probably. I still think buprenorphine is my favorite. That's the, like a partial agonist. That's a really clever solution. Mm -hmm. What is a partial agonist? Uh, so buprenorphine will stop the withdrawal symptoms, but it doesn't give you the euphoria. Mm -hmm. So it occupies the receptor space, but uh. you just you don't get that buzz. So you'll still experience sort of the behavior elements, but you're separating it from the physical uh, sort of withdrawal symptoms that occur now you do get discontinuation syndrome from buprenorphine mm -hmm. so you but typically the concept was that you would introduce it at a consistent dose and then gradually wean somebody off of it mm -hmm. uh obviously very similar in many ways to the methadone maintenance programs but yeah. uh, again all of the and there are a lot of different variables to look at for all of those programs but even just from a harm reduction point of view i think that somebody who's on methadone if they're going to co uh, medicate with anything, it, it is very common for them to do it with barbiturates, uh, and that is incredibly dangerous and leads to a ton of overdoses and a ton of issues with people who are on those maintenance things. So even just the availability of cannabis to substitute for their n modular use may be another harm reduction point, but from a clinical side, I don't think you could say anything, you know. There's a lot more research to do. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I mean, anecdotally, I mean, with people that you see, I mean, does it help with the symptoms or you know, or, or is it just more the, the reduction? Um, it's actually in both situations. Like a lot of individuals are using illicit narcotics. So for them, the assistance from the program is really with the, withdrawal, the, the withdrawals uh, that they're going through. Um, but you also have in some individuals on the program who aren't necessarily um, using uh, illicit narcotics or using prescriptions that they just want to substitute. They just don't want to have the same level of, you know, prescriptions that they're ingesting. They'd rather have something a bit more natural in their system. And we're also on our program noticing that there's a lot of individuals who are alcoholics or have abused alcohol um, that are using um, THC to even, you know, wean down that consumption as well. So in that scenario, it's obviously not the withdrawal. Um, it's more so, you know, I guess the quote unquote addiction that they're actually using the THC to help them combat. So I would say the, the information that we're gathering and the data that we're gathering is, is quite interesting to see that it's very much across the board in terms of uh, a lot of the demographics and uh, the uses uh, that we're assisting people um, with in terms of what, why they need the cannabis for. Well, this conversation has been growing more interesting. We're going to have to stop it here. Thank you for joining me today. Thank you, Chuck. Danke, Chuck. Cheers.